And uh, while he's getting ready, I'll introduce our, our next speaker, Professor Lars Chitka from University of London. And he is going to tell us um, about insects and whether or not insects are actually intelligent. And he's done some fantastic recent work to address this question. So um, sure. uh, as soon as he gets his slide up, I'll leave it over to you here. Queen Mary College at the University of London, I should have said. Um, very warm welcome, Lars. <laughs> All right, thank you very much for your very kind invitation. Um, this is how we train bees. Um, here's a bee, here's a reward, here's a sensory stimulus. Um, it's been known for over a hundred years that bees can learn visual features such as patterns of flowers or colors of flowers or odors and associate them with sugary rewards. Here's the tiny sucrose solution droplet that we're giving the bee. Um, and in addition to learning floral features, bees are fairly flexible in what kind of um, stimuli they can associate with rewards. Um, for a bee, this isn't a face, it's just a strange flower essentially. Um, but it doesn't have to be floral features that, um, that they can learn. But what I'll try to convince you of in the next 20 or so minutes is that there is a little more going on than just associative learning. Now, are bigger brains um, better? I think that question is, is about as informative as asking if bigger computers are better. And perhaps at some point or another, it was thought that computers had to look like that, um, and even better computers would have to be made even bigger. Um, but at that time, um, Richard Feynman pointed out uh, the opposite direction, that with clever engineering, you could make things a lot smaller. And so he suggested in a um, lecture famously entitled, There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom, why can't we write the entire 24 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica on the head of a pin? We know now that he was right, we can do that. Um, and I think given that sort of thing, I think we should be wary of using brain size as a measure of anything at all. Um, here's, a, here's a bee brain. Now, bee brains are small, um, both in absolute terms um, as well as in terms of neuron numbers. So a bee has fewer than um, a million neurons, quite a few of which are in the sensory um, visual and olfactory. So that's the, the visual ganglia evaluating information from the optic lobes. These um, antennal lobe um, uh, is the primary um, olfactory relay. And here are the mushroom bodies um, cent centers in to, um, in, in multisensory integration and learning and memory. Now, while these brains are small, they are not simple. So be wary of people who tell you they're studying insects because they're simple. Here's one neuron, okay? Um, that's one nerve cell, one of these 850,000 that I've just mentioned. This is a neuron that was discovered by Martin Hummer in Randolph Menzel's lab in the 1990s. That neuron alone has basically the structure of a fully grown oak tree. Okay? There are 850,000 of these. Not all of them are quite as complex. That neuron has a, is essentially the olfactory reward pathway in the, insect, in the, in the honeybee brain. That is the one cell that signals with ramifications throughout the antennal lobes and the mushroom bodies that the bee has just received a sugary reward. Okay? So you can make things very small, um, very elegantly, but they're not necessarily simple. Now, you should be wary of any field um, that gets by without a rigorous quantitative approach. So you can't measure intelligence in terms of either numbers of units, neurons mediating it, or just measuring the overall size. You need to look inside and see what's going on in there. And so what we've done in, in recent years is to use a computational neuroscience approach to ask what kind of abilities actually need what kind of circuitry um, in order to function efficiently. And it turns out that we've, we just use neurobiological information to feed into our models without tweaking the models to deliver any kind of computational or cognitive ability and then ask what kind of abilities pop out of these circuitries. And it turns out that these very simple models, the, these are models so simple as to be caricatures of what's really going on in the bee brain, Nonetheless, with the same circuitry that underpins associative learning, linking the internal lobes, for example, with the mushroom bodies, 
you get all kinds of advanced or abilities thought to be more advanced, such as peak shift, rule learning, negative and positive patterning, um, and in um, visual patterns, visual pattern cl classification, categorization, and so on, with handfuls of neurons. So what people think are computationally advanced abilities are often not, whereas abilities thought to be simple, such as associative learning, just color learning um, of a handful of colors, results in changes to mushroom body structure that can be measured in gross neuroanatomy. So associative learning is not simple. Several computationally or thought to be intelligent um, um, abilities are actually quite simple using the same sort of circuits as for associative learning. Now here's a bee's um, natural world. Um, bees are central place foragers. That's not just honeybees and bumblebees, but all um, several 10,000 species of solitary bees need to remember where their home is. Okay, they have a nest, their babies are in that nest. If they don't remember where their home is, they're stuffed. Okay, so there's very strong selection pressure on having highly accurate spatial memory. Now, which is not a trivial task if your home range size is um, several kilometers in radius. So honeybees will fly up to 10 kilometers away from their hives in order to um, find food and then return after visit visiting often multiple feeding sites. In addition, the world's not simple out there because um, there are all kinds of different flower species in any one bee's flight range. Um, and bees need to be careful shoppers in this floral supermarket that they are operating in. So they need to find the flowers with the best cost-benefit ratio um, to locate the flowers which offer the highest reward for the least efforts. Um, and then, forage, uh, then focus their foraging efforts only on those flowers and discard others um, that, um, that they have experienced as less rewarding. And, um, of course, these um, foraging sites are often distributed over wide areas, so it's not easy to follow bees around unless you have some fancy um, gimmicks like, um, like this harmonic radar system, which we can use to track bees over um, long periods of time. And then to see how they solve complex spatial foraging problems, such as, for example, simple versions of the traveling salesman problem. Sa traveling salesman problem is that faced by a traveling salesman. That is, you link a number of cities around Sweden, for example, or um, any other place in a way that minimizes travel distance um, and... Um, and expenditure. And so in this particular um, scenario here, we have a hive here and five foraging locations marked in blue. Um, and the bee has to figure out the most efficient solution to link these five. And of course, by default, it has no idea um, where to start. And the way to get at such problems is you need to track bees over the entire duration of them solving the problem. And that's what we've done here with harmonic radar tracking. So um, you see the bout number here. These are the number of attempts of flying from the hive to the feeders and back. Initially, she's only just discovered these two. So each track fades um, shortly after it's disappearing. You can see there's lots of exploration outside the area. There she's now found the fifth feeder. Still not very efficient solution, about 20 bouts now. But as we go to a higher number of bouts, the bee optimizes its path and gets better and better until she's actually found an optimal solution oops, to this traveling salesman problem. So in this case, through trial and error learning, um, the spatial solution arrived at for this five location traveling salesman problem becomes optimized. Now we're also interested in what bees do in natural settings when we don't give them feeders but they can choose their own um, to forage from. So the hive here is in the center. So here again we've tracked a single individual over its entire lifetime from the first time it's ever left the home to, um, the, to its death. Um, and it begins its foraging career with um, fairly erratic searching maneuvers um, that cover a large territory. The nest is here, and you can see that there are a number of um, loops in various directions. And that's all it did on um, the, the first day of its foraging career. There's another short bout marked in red here. But she's covered quite a bit of territory. Now, on day two, and then up to day eight in that bee's foraging career, um, so here's one more orientation loop. And now she's discovered something. She's discovered a good flower, um, foraging patch. And then over several days, all that bee does, this is 80 foraging, sequential foraging bots, is only visit that particular patch and return straight back to the hive. Then there was a, a day um, 
or two of, um, of poor weather, so the bee was, was inside the hive. After that, it returned... Oh, I should show you something else. During this, these, this first orientation flight, the bee already explored a patch over here um, that you can see in the next week or so, it never returned to that, so that patch was over here. Now, after a day of, um, of um, staying at home for bad weather reasons, the bee flies to this um, patch, the familiar patch, one more time, then flies back and out again, then changes it, its mind halfway, and then ends up at a patch that it had only visited 10 days earlier, once during an orientation flight, and then stays with that patch for the remainder of its days until it uh, eventually just disappeared during a regular foraging bout, perhaps caught by a, a bird or a crab spider. What are crab spiders? Um, so flowers aren't only rewarding, they're also often um, dangerous, so they're predators lurking on flowers, um, hunting pollinators, and um, these crab spiders are unique in that they can, sort of chameleon style, adopt the colors on the flowers of which they prey, at least to some extent. Um, and Tom Mings has explored that sort of um, um, the, the bee's responses to such um, crab spiders in laboratory settings where essentially he faced bees with um, robotic spiders. So here's a, a bee flying around, landing on a safe flower, and here are some dangerous flowers with uh, conspicuous crab spiders. And the bee makes a mistake. So this, this is safe for the bee. These are sponge pads, so the, the, the bee doesn't get harmed, but it does get very annoyed. Um, and it learns about it. So what you see is that after such experiences, the whole flight behavior of the bee changes in that they perform extensive scanning maneuvers before landing on flowers, especially if they've experienced that these spiders are cryptic, that they're hard to see. And so um, you can face bees with both um, cryptic spiders, yellow on yellow, um, so there's just shape from shading information, or white on yellow where they um, are con conspicuous. And in both cases of scenarios, with experience, bees learn to minimize the numbers of errors they make, so they make fewer and fewer landings on dangerous flowers. Um, but with cryptic spiders, bees' error rates remain relatively higher than with conspicuous spiders. But moreover, their scanning behavior changes so that when they're faced with cryptic spiders, that's the gray dots here, consistently their scanning durations of the flowers are higher than if they are with um, conspicuous spiders. And that continues to be the case if you test them the next day and without any kind of predation threat. There are no more spiders now. So their whole behavior changes so that they are evaluating the, 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 the threat on, on these flowers. And moreover, they're there are more and more false alarms. So bees that are faced with cryptic spiders on flowers um, respond to the, as if they're seeing ghosts. They sometimes reject flowers even if they're perfectly safe. So there's way more than a directly induced response to the aversive stimulus, but their entire behavior changes. And uh, Clint Perry has, has explored this sort of behavior in a, in a context of emotion-like states in um, a recent study um, where we um, tested bees in, in a setting where, uh, where they were in a go-no-go -no -go task, where they, were, they learned that on the left in this flight arena, um, they received a reward um, on this violet stimulus, and on the right side, say green, um, they received no reward. And then um, after experience in the gut for, the for a while, they get uh, the intermediate options and we measure their responses. And essentially what we're measuring is time to exploring that stimulus. And if bees know that they get a reward here, they're very fast at approaching this um, um, stimulus, whereas if they know they don't get a reward here, then it takes them quite a while to um, even crawl in there. But what about the intermediate stimuli? So if you give them something that's in the middle between these two, um, we can then measure how quickly they um, uh, um, accept that stimulus, and it turns out that whether or not they accept it depends on what they've experienced before actually um, 
um, entering the flight area. If we give the bees a tiny droplet of sucrose, sorry, that should be a Greek letter mu here, um, if, they give, if we give them a tiny um, surprise reward, then they will fly to the ambiguous stimulus faster than if they had not received that reward. And if you plot that over the number of intermediate options, so here's the rewarding option, they fly to that fast, here's the unrewarding option, they fly to that slowly, the intermediate ones, they fly at intermediate times. But if you give the bees that surprise reward before entering the arena, they consistently accept intermediate options faster. So that's a glass half full, glass half empty situation where if the bees received a surprise reward before um, being faced with the task, they respond in a glass half full manner, whereas otherwise they'll respond in a glass half empty manner. Now emotional states um, carry across multiple modalities typically, so um, what Clint then also explored um, is how bees, given a surprise reward, would respond to a predation threat of the same nature as with the crab spiders that we've just experienced, so the bees get uh, briefly um, held down by a sponge pad that's um, um, that's mechanically driven so we can control the strength and duration of the stimulus. And it turns out that if bees are given a reward prior to the predator attack, then their time to um, returning to uh, normal foraging activity is much shorter than if they had not received that surprise reward. So again, the, um, the, 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 there's a state change that carries across behavioral contexts um, where bees um, respond in this case, um, more or less strongly to a predatory, uh, simulated predator attack if they have been given reason to be optimistic about the world around them. So that's the kind of experiment that, um, that people usually accept as demonstrating emotional states, at least in vertebrates. Now, over the years of interacting with my um, primate and corvid colleagues, I was always a, a bit miffed by them saying, oh, all this stuff you're testing them is just uh, what bees face in nature anyway. So um, we sort of thought we'd turn that around and test bees in um, a task that, um, that um, corvids and other um, seemingly very clever animals are typically tested. This is a string pulling task. There's a flower here under the table with a reward in it, and the only way to get to that reward um, is to pull the string out um, and, um, and, um, and, and ultimately um, get the reward that's in the center. Yeah, that was the first bee that ever succeeded with that task, so we were quite pleased with that. Um, the vast majority of bees require stepwise training, so shaping, um, which might be fairly unsurprising, but there's a very tiny minority of bees that, might, that actually solve this task spontaneously. But the best way to train a bee um, is to have it trained by another bee. Um, so here is marked in red a knowledgeable demonstrator that's already familiar with the task. This one has no idea how to do it because she's never seen it before. But you can see that she pays very careful attention to what that demonstrator does. Um, and in the end, basically scrounges on um, the efforts of the demonstrator. And now they both suck up the reward um, together. And you do that a good number of times. Um, typically a handful, um, and the bee, the previously non-knowledgeable, um, naive individual, will then be able to solve the task um, all by itself if left to its own devices. You can see now that the, uh, they're both getting nervous because the reward's been depleted. Um, the um, experienced demonstrator walks over to the next floor. This one has no idea what to do yet, um, but she eventually realizes that there really isn't anything else, then runs over and helps the demonstrator consume the reward again. Um, but eventually she'll, she'll learn um, doing the task by herself. Um, if you do that with an entire colony, this is a social network of a bee colony. Um, the, um, each dot here is one bee, one individual, um, and um, the, 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 the colony has been seeded with a single trained individual. And what we're trying to uh, quantify here is the, the, the speed with which the information spreads through the colony. And each line here is an interaction between two individuals. Um, and the dot colored at the moment that the observer individual for the first time solves the task by itself. 
And what you can see here, so there's a whole number, so when they're white, they haven't learned it yet. When they turn colored, they have learned it. All these orange individuals have learned it from the single train demonstrator from generation one. But you can now see that there are other colors showing up. And these are individuals that have no longer learned the um, information from the originally trained individual, but from second generation learners. And so as you continue um, with this exercise, then eventually all the individuals will learn it, they will all turn colored, but you will see several sequential generations, not biological generations, but, in, but generations in terms of um, learners, um, where eventually actually the original individual dies and the, the, the skill continues to spread um, through the colony. Now, you could still view perhaps the this um, string pulling task in the remotest way in, an, in a context of obstacle removal. Perhaps a, a bee finding some twig that's fallen into its nest entrance and pulling it out. So we, we were interested in finding out whether we could use get the bees to use a, a detached object, something that's not attached in any way to the reward, and walk away from the location of the reward and bring an object to it in order to get a reward. So in this case, the bees have to um, roll a ball in order to, into, into the area of the yellow ring, and if they manage to do that, um, then they get a reward. And, and here's, here's a skilled bee um, that's uh, sort of behaving a bit like a, like a dung beetle, except it rolls the ball the wrong way around, but um, now she gets her reward. Um, so this certainly shows her that being playing football doesn't require a very large brain. Um, <laughs> so far, so good. You could still explain that in, t in, in, in Skinnerian terms, but, um, but we then did, um, again, the, the best way to train um, naive bees if, is to have the, the technique demonstrated by, by an informed individual. But here we've played a trick. Um, the trick we've played is that there are three balls, and obviously the easiest way to solve the task is to take the ball that's closest to the target and move that to, um, to the desired um, um, central arena. Um, but the, what we've done is we've glued down both this ball and this ball so that all this demonstrator ever does, because the demonstrator knows she can't use the other balls, they're, they're fixed down, is to roll the most distant ball. Okay, so that Experience B only rolls the, the most distant ball extra, um, ever, and um, so this is how that looks. Um, and um, the, the, the other B simply observes how it's done, and then they both get a, um, a reward to, um, to consume together. And we do that three times. Okay, there are three interactions. The, the observer never rolls the ball during these interactions, she just observes. And then the observer is left to its own devices and faced with three options. One being the, the, the distant ball that she had observed the demonstrator rolling, and two alternatives that are both closer to the target. Now, the clever thing to do is not to ape, to copy the, the demonstrator, but to use the closest ball um, and move that to the center. And that's exactly what the um, naive bees do. So that bee has never rolled a ball before. Okay, she's just observed it being done by, by the demonstrator bee and spontaneously picks the ball that's closest to the target in order to collect its reward. Moreover, this even works if the ball is of a different color. So if we replace the yellow balls with black balls, um, the observer bee would still spontaneously pick the one closest to the target, clearly showing that it's not just sensory motor contingencies of associating where yellow needs to be in that setting or something like that. So a few conclusions. Um, Sorry, this is a bit uh, wordy, but I'll, um, I'll, I'll try to make it brief. So first of all, in neural computational terms, the task that requires a big brain hasn't been discovered yet. Okay, So whatever you ask computational neuroscience or whatever scientists or whatever you ask of our brain models, um, most computations are relatively cheap, actually. Even consciousness-like phenomena, if you ask robotics people predicting the outcomes of your own actions, for example, um, requires perhaps 40,000 neurons. Okay, that's, that would just show, so show up in gross neuroanatomy in an insect brain, but it isn't much. Things like self-recognition are computationally pretty trivial, actually. 
Now, this might also, I think, raise the possibility that um, when selection pressure is there, um, all kinds of uh, seemingly advanced cognitive abilities might evolve relatively easily. And the question, I think, then you need to ask of why certain animals in the wild don't perform well in certain tasks or haven't solved them is, is not, is it computationally implausible or difficult to do, but why don't they solve it? And th more often than not, the question, the answer might be that there simply hasn't been selective pressure um, that favors solving these kinds of tasks. Now we know that and have known for a long time that generalist bees need to learn floral features and, uh, and need to have accurate spatial memory and I think that the circuits evolved in mediating these abilities can be co-opted for in a very versatile manner um, for problems that are actually not part of, of a bee's um, daily repertoire. Now I think we can still stretch ourselves really, really far and explain everything I've just said in associative learning terms, in Skinnerian terms. But we also have to realize that these explanations are ever more convoluted and I sometimes feel a little bit like defending a flat earth view um, which for many millennia was actually very useful for navigating, but you had to make ever more elaborate um, um, explanations for why certain things rotate around the Earth in, in strange kinds of ways. And it, alternatively, we might actually um, have to accept the, the possibility that bees actually have consciousness, that they have a model of the world around them in, that allows them to um, predict the outcomes of their own actions, that they know what they want, so to speak, um, and then explore uh, possible solutions in their mind space to um, solve the particular tasks. But I don't have a definite um, answer to the question of consciousness and bees. I'm just throwing that at the audience and you can give me some answers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lars. That was fascinating. I'm sure there's a couple of questions. Yes. Thank you, Arach. This is really, really beautiful work. Um, so, how are bees different from other insects? Or is it you touched on general, the generalists, and they also have a very special social system? So, how general do you think that other insects might also be intelligent in this kind of, or some of those ways yep. that you described? Um, so there are some things that other insects can do that bees can't. Um, so there are a number of polystyne wasp species with very small colonies um, that actually have individual face recognition. Um, and the reason bees don't have that is not obviously because it's not computationally plausible in an insect because wasps can do it with equally um, small brains. Um, the reason is that these um, wasps have very tiny colonies, about a dozen members, and highly individualized facial features. So their face recognition makes sense and they can do it. Um, and they use it in a um, in, in, to reinforce a linear hierarchy that they have in these nests um, where the hierarchical position is, is fought out by, by duels. And uh, so it makes sense to remember whom you lose against or whom you win against. And that's the context in which um, that's used. Um, there are often ideas that the intelligence that you see in some of these insects has something to do with sociality, and maybe that applies to some forms, but not others. Um, in terms of, um, if you think about that string-pulling task, there's actually a vid video floating around on um, social media about a solitary bee pulling a nail out of its nest. And uh, the, 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 it's an interesting challenge in that, obviously, it's one that was never faced before in the evolutionary history of that solitary bee species. Some nasty person, um, so that um, bee nests in a hole in a brick, um, has pushed a nail into the nest entrance. Okay? That bee has never seen that challenge before. She lands on the nail and spontaneously starts pulling. Okay? So it's not that she sort of senselessly, like a reflex machine, tries to pull past the nail, she has, an, in my view, an idea of what she wants to do and then acts accordingly. And tries a variety of techniques, including at some point standing on the nail and flying its wings backwards in order to use the wind generated to pull the nail out and so on. Um, so there's a solitary bee that um, acts in a, in a fairly um, 
clever manner, but I'm not saying that that applies to all insects. I suspect in many cases the reason that we're finding these abilities in social insects is because they're convenient laboratory animals. We can get good sample sizes with them, um, but there might be, well, equally advanced abilities in many others that are just more difficult to test in the lab. Any further questions? Yes. Others. Uh, yes, I was wondering then uh, if bees can be so clever. So why do we we humans need so big brains? Because uh, it's very costly for childbirth, for example. Um, I don't know is the honest answer, but but then no one else does. Um, so but you have to ask what is actually gained by um, by any kind of increase in brain size. So we've already heard that the biggest single explanatory for increases in brain size is body size. So bigger animals need bigger brains for simple biophysical com com um, constraints because you need to carry your signals over longer distances. Now, anything above the line, of course, um, invites further interpretation. Um, but you have to actually explore what is actually gained in circuitry terms, what modules are added in. Um, and so far as we can tell, the human brain is largely a scaled up chimp brain. It's not that chimps, for example, don't have Broca's and Wernicke's area. They do. They just don't have the same language abilities. So you need to ask, do you, in a larger brain, simply have more parallel processes all doing the same thing? Um, which could matter in sensory systems, it could also matter in terms of storage capacity. So it might well be that um, with a larger hippocampus you can store more locations in your environment without actually adding any computational levels. It's just a, a higher quant... Uh, it's the equivalent of a bigger hard drive. But um, you could also argue that in a larger brain you have more redundancy in, if, in case anything goes wrong. So you can patch up for, for brain injury, for example, in that, 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 um, that certain areas that get damaged, their functions can be taken over by other brain areas. You don't perhaps need that in an insect that um, with its three-week li lifespan is unlikely to experience a stroke. Um, so I could speculate endlessly, but um, I, I, it, it would be speculation. Thank you. Okay, one last question. So, uh, fascinating with this uh, social spread of solutions to problems. This was, uh, in these examples, done visually, uh, but spatial information can be communicated by dancing, I think. Uh, can they also communicate um, behavioral strategies like be careful, high reward, it's dangerous, without non-visual communication, if the question is lucid? Mm -hmm. So bumblebees don't have the dance, um, but honeybees do. Um, and you're right, the, the, the number of words in the dance language is actually quite limited. So by default, uh, the, the dance language itself com communicates coordinates, um, so fly 700 meters northeast. But there are also signals that communicate the existence of danger, so-called stop signals where foragers come back from a good foraging site and interfere with other dancers indicating that same foraging site. But, so I think this is a little outside the area of cognition because by and large for all we know most of these um, words in the dance language of course as well as their reading are hardwired. Okay. <laughs>